Attention! This makes absolutely no sense. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Xander's Facts. What is going on, everybody? Welcome into the latest edition of the Xander Specs Podcast. I am, of course, the aforementioned Xander. It is Wednesday, May 24th. This is episode 106 of the podcast. Thank you all so much for listening. It is, of course, a podcast that is going to be filled with facts this week, a fact-filled podcast, which I feel like I don't need to say every week because it's kind of redundant because you should assume coming into this podcast that it's a Xander's Facts podcast. There's going to be facts on it, which there are. But this week, we're going to be talking about something a little bit interesting. Something that I know everybody just loves so much. Everybody loves doing their taxes every April on tax day. We all love filing our taxes with the government. It's the thing that gives us so much joy. You know, on those days, I think we're all just proud to be Americans. But you know what? Americans aren't the only ones who pay taxes. Basically, if you live in any country in the world, almost any country in the world, you pay taxes. But the ways that some countries do their tax systems are a lot different than the ways the United States does it. And I don't know about y'all, but ours kind of stinks. So we're going to be talking about why it stinks this week on the podcast. And then we're going to be talking about how it could change. Because I think a lot of people are in this never-ending cycle of just, it's never going to change, this is always terrible. But it doesn't have to be this terrible. There are ways that it can be much better, which we're going to talk about this week on the Zaders Facts Podcast. But before we do, just wanted to remind you all that if you like the Zaders Facts Podcast, if you think you're going to like all the facts on this week's edition, remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 106, Rate and review the podcast too, and then check us out on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. I'm on all those, at Xander's Facts. That is Xander with a Z. And most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast. Tell all your friends about the podcast, about the newsletter. If you don't know it, it's called Xander's Weekend Facts because it comes out every Sunday morning. It has a recap of the week's top headlines so you never miss a thing. It is free on Substack. Sign up in the episode's description to get it in your email inbox every Sunday morning. There's also the Zaders Facts link tree, because that has all the Zaders Facts links that you need for the podcast, for the newsletter, for all the facts. So many facts on the Zaders Facts link tree. Go check that out. Let's get to our main topic this week, because I know it's something that everybody loves. I don't think so. Taxes. Filing taxes. Tax day is the greatest day of the year. Fourth of July is not the most patriotic day of the year. It is tax day. April something. But I feel like a lot of people probably don't agree with my sentiments, and that was because it was sarcasm. Not a lot of people love doing taxes. I don't know if anybody does. Maybe a CPA. But filing your taxes each spring, obviously, as you know if you have done it, can be extremely complicated. But There are several companies, ones like H&R Block and TurboTax, that can help simplify it for you. Of course, that comes at a cost. But put all your preconceived notions about filing taxes away from this podcast, you know, oh, the government needs my money. We're not talking about that this week. Quit your whining. We're talking about the process and the companies that are behind the process, because it's not just, as you know, the IRS in the federal government. The big issue is that filing taxes is extremely complicated. And when we look at how other countries do their tax systems, it doesn't have to be. So the question is, why is it so complicated and time consuming? And what solutions are there to help us fix this problem? Well, those are questions you probably have. And those are questions that I'm going to answer with some facts and more on this week's podcast. Let's get to it. We got a lot of facts this week. Let's do it. So let's start with basically an overview of how our tax system came to be and the problem. So, you know, filing your taxes is something that everyone does, basically. In almost every country in the world, it's not just an American thing. The government ain't out to get you. Because if that was the case, then they'd all be coming to get you. But the way that the United States handles this process is a lot different than, say, some other countries. So to get to the root of the issues we're talking about today, we're going to take another little trip, quick trip, 
through American history, as we love to do Ugh. on this podcast, all the way back to 1773, before the birth of the nation. The Boston Tea Party. You all know what happened to the Boston Tea Party. No taxation without representation, because obviously we were under the monarchy in England, but now we're not. That did kind of lead to the founding of the country we know was the United States of America. Obviously, there was a war and all that. So you could kind of say that the issue of taxation is kind of what led to the birth of America. America! I don't think historians would argue with me on that. But fast forward, the federal income tax. Oh, we all love that. The one that we all know and love. That wasn't implemented until 1862 by the president at the time, who was Abraham Lincoln who said it was because the government needed to pay for the Civil War. But it was repealed 10 years later. Then in 1894, the president was Grover Cleveland, and the Wilson-Gorman Tariff Act was passed. That brought it back, and it created an income tax division that was located in what was called the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which is now the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, which was created in 1862 thanks to the Revenue Act of 1862, which came with that first federal income tax. However, in 1894, the Supreme Court didn't like that idea. So the next year, they killed the federal income tax. So it died for a second time. So then we get to this thing called the 16th Amendment, which was passed by Congress in 1909. And the 16th Amendment says... Quote, the Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration, unquote. So that amendment was ratified in 1913, which then gave Congress the authority to pass the Revenue Act of 1913, which reestablished the federal income tax. And this time... The Supreme Court gave its approval. Oh my gosh, Clarence, thank you. Just kidding, Clarence was not on the court then. Not funny. Since then, though, the government has introduced the Form 1040, implemented the progressive tax system, and many presidents from FDR to Reagan to, you know, Donnie Boy, have made changes to individual tax rates. But there's been a lot of changes over the years to taxing policies, because of the many different administrations, of course. And that means that the tax system we use today is a little bit disjointed. There's a ton of tax credits. There's a ton of deductions that are now in the system. And those have kind of made things messy. Now, some of those tax credits are great. But all of that stuff in the system has kind of made things, you know, a bit wonky. So, now to file your taxes you could just fill out the IRS's forms yourself. But that's a little complicated. Because of all the complexities that have gone into the tax filing system, it's probably a lot simpler to have somebody do it for you. Now, that could be a CPA or a tax pro, which you have to pay for, of course, or it could be a large company that is dedicated to filing taxes. And now we enter the tax software industry. You probably know the names. TurboTax, H&R Block, Jackson Hewitt, Tax Act, the Tax Slayer, Tax Slayer Gator Bull. There's a ton of them out there. That's not even scratching the surface. Now, these companies do great work in allowing you to simply file your taxes when possible, or simply, I guess, in context, because as we all know by using them, it's, you know, not too simple. But they also do some not so great things. And to take a look at the problem, we have to head outside our borders. The caravan. Because not every country uses an H&R Block and a TurboTax to file their taxes. And not every country has its citizens take hours to do so. In fact, for specifics, U.S. taxpayers spend an average of 13 hours preparing their tax returns last year. And also last year, they paid an average of $240 for tax preparation services. That's a lot of numbers. That's much different, though, to a country like, say, Estonia. Estonia is this small country that just has 1.3 million people on the Baltic Sea in Northern Europe. It's a part of NATO. But Estonia actually ranked first in last year's International Tax Competitive Index, which was compiled by the Tax Foundation. 
That's because taxpayers in that country only have to pay a grand total of zero dollars and spend less than five minutes each year filing their taxes. Now that's because in Estonia, the country's revenue department has its own web-based system that gives every taxpayer a personal tax account and it automatically fills in salary information, child-related deductions, tax liabilities, and a lot more. Its southern neighbor, Latvia, ranks second on that index, and on that same index, the U.S. finished in 22nd. That's behind countries like Turkey, which was 9th, Israel, which was 10th, Canada, which was 16th, and Costa Rica, which was 19th. Whoops. Now, several of those countries, including Estonia, use that service which is commonly known as Ready Return. In those countries that use Ready Return, some of the other ones are Denmark, Sweden, Spain, and the UK. Their revenue departments take the information that they receive from your employer and from your bank, and they pre-fill a tax return. Then, you go online to check it and make sure everything looks correct, and if it does, that's it. You're done. Whoa. I mean, uh, how about that? Like, that sounds pretty good. And California, in the United States, California even, first tested it out in 2005. And in 2012, they had over 88,000 taxpayers who used the system. Now, California's a big state. But 88,000 taxpayers is still a lot. And it saved the state over $125,000 instead of using paper returns. And 99% of respondents in a survey said that they were satisfied with that system. 96% said it was more convenient than what they did in the past. 95% said it saved them time. And 98% said that they would use it again. That was a fact. And now a bunch of the services that were included in the Ready Return program are now included in the state's free tax prep program, which is called CalFile. But the IRS and the United States government don't use this type of system. Instead, in 2002, we had something called the Free File Alliance, which was created, which allowed those private tax software companies we talked about earlier to create their own tax filing websites that had the option to provide free services to some qualifying taxpayers. Well, that sounds dandy, but why is this? It turns out, though, might have something to do with those private companies, specifically Intuit, which is the company that bought TurboTax's software in 1993. In 2019, so four years ago, ProPublica published an expose into the tactics that Intuit has used to make sure that the U.S. government does not make major changes to the tax filing process. The article even notes, quote, But the success of TurboTax rests on a shaky foundation, one that could collapse overnight if the U.S. government did what most wealthy countries did long ago and made tax filing simple and free for most citizens, unquote. That sounds pretty good. I know, if you listen to last week's podcast, where we talked about the weaponization of education. If you haven't, you should go listen to that podcast, episode 105. Same as Bog. I know last week I did a lot of reading from articles, but I'm going to read a little bit of this article from ProPublica, which I've linked in the episode description, by the way, so you can read it too, to detail how Intuit has prevented the IRS from implementing a ready return-like system. So I'll start here right after that quote I just read. For more than 20 years, Intuit has waged a sophisticated, sometimes covert war to prevent the government from doing just that, according to internal company and IRS documents and interviews with insiders. The company unleashed a battalion of lobbyists and hired top officials from the agency that regulates it. From the beginning, Intuit recognized that its success depended on two parallel missions, stoking innovation in Silicon Valley while stifling it in Washington. Indeed, employees ruefully joke that the company's motto should actually be compromise without integrity. Internal presentations lay out company tactics for fighting quote-unquote encroachment into its catch-all term for any government initiative to make filing taxes easier, such as creating a free government filing system or pre-filling people's returns with payroll or other data the IRS already has. Quote, for a decade, proposals have sought to create IRS tax software 
or a return-free tax system. All were stopped, unquote. That's what read a confidential 2007 PowerPoint presentation from an Intuit Board of Directors meeting. The company's 2014-15 plan included manufacturing third-party grassroots support. One internal PowerPoint slide stated, quote, buy ads for op-eds, editorials, stories in African-American and Latino media, unquote. The centerpiece of Intuit's anti-encroachment strategy has been the free file program. Hatched 17 years ago, 21 now, in a moment of crisis for the company. Under the terms of an agreement with the federal government, Intuit and other commercial tax prep companies promised to provide free online filing to tens of millions of lower-income taxpayers. In exchange, the IRS pledged not to create a government-run system. Since Free Files launch, Intuit has done everything it could to limit the program's reach while making sure the government stuck to its end of the deal. As ProPublica has reported, Intuit added code to the free file landing page of TurboTax that hid it from search engines like Google, making it harder for would-be users to find. 12 years ago, 16 now, Intuit launched its own free product, the similarly named free edition of TurboTax. But unlike the government program, this one comes with traps that can push customers lured with the promise of free into paying some more than $200. Free edition was a smash hit for Intuit, and its pitch for free, Prep, remains core to the company's growth. Recently, it launched a free, 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 free ad campaign for the free edition, including a crossword puzzle in the New York Times in which the answer to every clue was F-R-E-E. I don't know about y'all, but I remember those ads, and ugh. Terrible. Intuit knows it's deceiving its customers. That's what internal company documents obtained by ProPublica show. Quote, the website lists free, 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 and the customers are assuming their return will be free. Unquote, said a company PowerPoint presentation that reported the results of an analysis of customer calls in 2019. Quote, customers are getting upset. Unquote. Intuit also continues to use dark patterns, design tricks to get users of its website to do things they don't necessarily mean to do to ensure that as many customers as possible pay, former employees say. A marketing concept frequently invoked at Intuit, which goes by the acronym FUD, FUD, seeks to tap into Americans' fear, uncertainty, and doubt about the tax filing process. An Intuit spokesman declined to answer ProPublica's detailed questions about its efforts to fend off a government filing system, but he did provide a statement which said, quote, We empower our customers to take control of their financial lives, which includes being in charge of their own tax preparation, adding that a, quote, government-run pre-filled tax preparation system that makes the tax collector, who is also the investigator, auditor, and enforcer, the tax preparer, is fraught with conflicts of interest, unquote. The IRS is seemingly the biggest threat to Intuit and other commercial tax prep businesses, but it has more frequently acted as the industry's ally, defending the free file program in the face of critical internal reviews. The IRS declined to comment for this article. The consequences of Intuit's efforts affect a huge proportion of the tax-paying public. Americans spend an estimated 1.7 billion hours and 31 billion with a B dollars doing their taxes each year. Just 2.8 million participated in the free file program in 2019, which was down from 5.1 million at the program's peak in 2005. All right, no more reading. Story time! So basically, what all that said is there's a way to file your taxes for free. But again, there's qualifications. And also, apparently, TurboTax doesn't want you to know about it, the free file program. TurboTax launched their own free system, which was time-consuming and confusing because all it did was lure you into actually paying, even though it said free, 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 free. But of course, TurboTax loves the Free File Alliance partnership because it says the government 
can't launch their own system. Remember when we talked about all the money that's infiltrated politics a couple episodes ago, we talked about it and why it's really not a very good thing for a country and our democracy. Here's another reason as to why. Because companies like TurboTax are actively trying to get the most money they can from us, the consumers, the taxpayers, for something that could absolutely be simple and free. Judge Xander. So, you know, obviously, a ready return style system would work wonders, and it would save time, and it would save money for basically everybody. But the free file system doesn't even go that far. So that might be a ways off. But there is hope. And that's because of something that the IRS is doing that was just reported on last week, which was a major surprise. And I think kind of went under the radar, because I don't think a lot of people know this. But last week, the Washington Post was the first to report that, quote, the Internal Revenue Service has quietly built its own prototype system to allow Americans to file tax returns digitally and free of charge, according to three current and former agency officials, essentially creating government software that could disrupt the tax prep industry, unquote. I mean, there you go. That's what we want. Why do we keep giving companies like TurboTax all our money when this could just be done for free by the government? The article continues, though, quote, The system will be available through a pilot program for a small group of taxpayers by January when the 2024 filing season begins, said the people briefed on the matter who spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss internal agency conversations. It was developed by the IRS and the U.S. Digital Service, the White House's technology consulting agency, unquote. Now, how or why is this all possible? Because the IRS is a severely underfunded and understaffed organization, agency. Well, that would be thanks to a little bill that we have talked a lot about on this podcast, which is called the Inflation Reduction Act. Remember that? That was a couple years ago. That bill included $15 million that was given to the IRS to look into creating a direct filing program. And the bill actually gave the IRS a lot more money, $80 billion with a B, dollars over 10 years to help the agency's efforts in increasing enforcement for high-income earners, while also improving taxpayer services and modernizing the technology that the agency used. And it's money that the IRS needs, because as I said, that agency is severely underfunded, it is severely understaffed. Of course, Republicans don't like that money that's going to the IRS. They've consistently claimed, you've probably heard about this, that the IRS is hiring 87,000 agents that will target hardworking Americans. They keep talking about it. They've brought it up since, well, the election. They kept talking about it. And now they keep talking about it because they control the House. But their claim has been debunked by many outlets, including Time, The New York Times, CNBC, the American Bar Association, CNN, and a bunch of others. In fact, CNN found five ways that the claim is misleading. With evidence, it's not just analysis, like you might find on CNN sometimes. It's actual evidence, because I linked the article that this is found in the episode's description, so you can go check it out for yourself. They found that the 87,000 figure, which comes from a, by the way, a 2021 Treasury report that estimates the IRS could hire 86,852 full-time employees actually refers to all employees, not just auditors. Many new hires will be replacements. That 4,000 customer service reps were hired last year. If y'all know how long it takes to get in touch with the IRS, you'll be like, that's a godsend. Also, that the law is meant to target taxpayers who make more than $400,000 a year which we've consistently said on this podcast, and new funding could actually improve the taxpayer service. But, you know, you got to do the fear-mongering. They got to vote for you somehow. You got to get them all riled up, even if it's lies. Because that 87,000, they're coming for you claim 
It's a total lie. Too many facts. And that might have something to do with the fact that between January and March of this year, the Washington Post found that Intuit spent $1 million on lobbying lawmakers on issues that include tax system integrity and intellectual property protections. And H&R Block, over that same time period, spent $720,000 lobbying on things like tax administration, and internal revenue service funding. That's according to the disclosures that they have to file. So, you know, if some politicians can argue that the government doesn't work, then they can get people to lose trust in the government. That's what a lot of politicians are banking on. Except for the fact that those same politicians aren't going to give the government the funds that it needs to succeed. Like, if you just leave the IRS high and dry with no money, or barely any money, and you say, oh, it's not working, we need to privatize this system because it's clearly not working. Well, you're the one who made it not work. But that's kind of what they're banking on, and a lot of people actually believe them, sadly. But into it responded to the Washington Post article, they said, quote, a direct-to-IRS e-file system is wholly redundant and is nothing more than a solution in search of a problem and that solution will unnecessarily cost taxpayers billions of dollars, unquote. H&R Block said, quote, Today, the consumer has great choice and flexibility in where they turn for free help, with more than 30 organizations offering free tax preparation, half of which are nonprofit organizations. We remain committed to delivering the digital capabilities and human expertise and care that helps millions of Americans get the best outcome at tax time, unquote. Uh-huh, okay. Well, just to let you all know, Intuit, just this month, had to start making payments to 4.4 million low-income Americans after it settled a lawsuit for $141 million because, quote, it had to resolve claims that it misled taxpayers and diverted them away from free products to premium services. Unquote. Doesn't sound so great to me. This is true. You know, and there is something else besides TurboTax that we could do. This IRS system is obviously in its infancy, and it isn't exactly a ready return style system, but it is a big step that is coming despite all these attacks from the private sector, from the multi billion dollar tax software industry. Now, I was doing all this research for this podcast, and it kind of reminded me of something else that's going on with another agency of the federal government. And so for that, I want to take a little detour and talk about the National Weather Service. I didn't ask that. Now, you may know this, but the National Weather Service is located under NOAA. NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And according to its mission statement, NWS is tasked with weather, water, and climate data, forecasts, warnings, and impact-based decision support services for the protection of life and property and enhancement of the national economy. Now, for people who kind of know me on a personal level, besides Xander's Facts Podcast, you know I'm kind of a weather nerd. We talk about weather sometimes on this podcast, just a little bit. I'm not, you know, a whole meteorologist or anything. I just, it's interesting to me. And so when I get asked what the best place to find weather information is, I give you two answers. The local news, because they're the meteorologists who are right there, or the National Weather Service, whose website, by the way, is weather.gov. Despite the fact that the NWS doesn't have its own app on your phone or your iPad or your tablet or whatever. But why is that? Because it's 2023 and the National Weather Service doesn't have an app. Because, you know, there's an Apple Weather app that comes pre-downloaded on your phone. AccuWeather has an app. The Weather Channel has an app. Weather Underground has an app. There are thousands of weather apps that you can download from the App Store. Some of them are really good. But there's others that, you know, aren't. The fact is, though, most of these apps and private companies like AccuWeather and IBM which owns the Weather Channel's digital properties, by the way, get their underlying data 
from the National Weather Service, whose data is publicly available for free on their website. Cool facts, bro. Of course, it's a website that isn't very intuitive, but it still gives you a lot of wonderful information. Like, listen, y'all, it's an old website, but there's a reason for that, because just like the IRS, the NWS is very underfunded. These different companies, like AccuWeather, IBM, they then add their own spin to it. So they don't just give you the National Weather Service data, because if that was true, they'd have the same things. But they don't, because they put their own little magic or spin or whatever on the data. Like, for example, I got my phone right here. I'm going to take a look at all, because I got a ton of weather apps on my phone. I got all these different apps that'll all tell me what the temperature is where I am right now. All right, so let's look. Right now, I'm on the Apple Weather app. It tells me right now it is 57 degrees, 5-7. On AccuWeather, it says it's 60 degrees, okay? Well, on the Weather Channel, if it loads, the Weather Channel app is very slow, sorry. It says it's 59, so three different apps, three different temperatures. How about that? And then. If I go to weather.gov and I type in my zip code, it tells me it's 58 degrees. Huh. So I just use four different, those are basically the four leading weather platforms. And they all told me four different temperatures, which you wouldn't think is that big of a deal. But you know, it may just be one or two degrees, but that could be super important, you know, especially if it's the difference between, you know, 31 and 34 degrees, because that means you're either getting rain or you're getting ice and snow. And even to get the full features of these apps, you're going to have to pay for everything they want. AccuWeather, which, by the way, gives you a 45-day forecast in its app, which is complete BS, by the way, because most meteorologists conclude that anything outside of a 7 to 10 day forecast is not reliable at all with the current technology that we have. In fact, when they came out with that in 2015, I believe it was called somewhere a joke, because it is. Is it actually? AccuWeather, which they provide that for free, but AccuWeather wants you to sign up for what they call Premium Plus, which runs for $4 a month or $20 a year. The Weather Channel whose app takes forever to load, apparently, asks you to go premium for $30 per year, or you can pay $10 per year just to get rid of ads on the app. But the National Weather Service already provides quality and accurate weather data with no ads for free. You know, it just doesn't have an app, and its website is many, many years old. But that means that it isn't always useful, because, you know, usually when I want to use the weather app, I just want to look at it for a quick second to see what the temperature is or what the high temperature is going to be or if it's going to rain or snow today or whatever, or if I'm in an awkward social situation and then I'll just look at my weather app. But I will tell you that NWS does operate mobile.weather.gov, which is a better experience on the phones, but again, you have to go on like Chrome or Safari because it's a website. It's still not an app. And just like I said with the IRS, it's because of funding issues. Like the IRS, the NWS is underfunded and couldn't come up, even if it wanted to, with the funds to build an app unless Congress allocates the agency money. But do you think companies like AccuWeather would like that? No, they would not. They have spent decades fighting increased funding for the National Weather Service. Like back in 2005, the National Weather Service launched its brand new website which, by the way, I believe has the same design as it does now, so I don't think it's had a major update in 18 years. But when that happened, the private weather companies did not like it. They complained. Back in 2012, there was talk of the National Weather Service launching an app, and the companies freaked out again. Actually, there's a Washington Post article from 2012, back then, 11 years ago. 11 years ago, we were having this conversation, and still... We don't have a National Weather Service app. But there's a Washington Post article from back then. There's a quote that I found in it that was interesting. It's from Dan Sobian, 
who was the director of the National Weather Service Employees Union. He said back in 2012, quote, it's pretty clear to me that the World Wide Web is old technology and that in the next 10 years, it's all going to be on apps. If you want to be able to communicate to people, that's the future. The Weather Service has to be on the cutting edge of that in order to succeed in our mission, unquote. You know what? Pretty good prediction, I'd say. World Wide Web isn't exactly old technology, but the future absolutely was apps. It's all true! That quote came, though, from the NWS prohibiting its employees from developing apps for mobile devices, which came with pushback from rank-and-file employees of the National Weather Service. And that is all because of the lobbying that's been done by companies like AccuWeather. In fact, you may not know this, but back in 2017, at the beginning of you-know-who's presidential administration, the then-president appointed someone named Barry Lee Myers to be the head of NOAA. Myers was the CEO and general counsel for, you guessed it, AccuWeather. Uh-oh. Which, of course, came with worries that Myers would try to privatize the Weather Service, which obviously wouldn't be too great because then we wouldn't have all this public and free weather information, which I would probably consider essential. His appointment ended up lasting two years in the Senate, though, because of financial conflict concerns, the fact that he was not a meteorologist and lacked scientific expertise, and because of an investigation that was conducted by the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs that found rampant, persuasive, and severe harassment at AccuWeather while Myers was the CEO. So after nearly three years, in November of 2019, Myers finally withdrew his name from consideration. And while it's of course terrible that Noah didn't have a Senate-appointed head since 2017, because Obama's head was forced out when the new administration came in, in fact, current Noah head Nick Spinrad, who was nominated by President Biden and assumed office back in 2021, he was the first Senate-confirmed administrator that Noah's had since 2017. So there were four years there during a certain person's administration where there was no NOAA administrator. And remember, it wasn't because the Democrats were stifling his appointment. Republicans, that was a Republican Senate who didn't approve of him. So, you know, just add that to the reasons of why those four years were a disaster. But it would have been a travesty if Byers, an, a literal enemy of the National Weather Service for decades, fought against them for decades, had been appointed its leader. That would have been horrible. Once again, it would have been an effort to claim that because government can't run effectively, you shouldn't trust it. Even though the people who claim it are the ones who are actively trying to kill it. Like buyers. Don't you think that instead of paying AccuWeather and other private companies for their services, which many large companies that have to rely on weather forecasting do, don't you think that getting those same services, likely with better accuracy, for free from the National Weather Service would be better? Gash facts. I think so. Like, the reason the National Weather Service website is so old isn't because they're incompetent. It's because they literally lack the resources to be able to improve it or build an app. And you know who loves that? Who loves that they have a lack of resources is AccuWeather. And you know what? Apps like AccuWeather and the Weather Channel, they like to tell me sometimes it's raining. Even though I can look up in the sky and look and see, it's not raining. So, I wouldn't call it very accurate. Need some ice for that sick burn? Like, if the National Weather Service did have an app, that would be my absolute go-to. And if Congress would approve funding for the agency, that would be amazing. But of course, you know, we have a divided Congress at the moment. So, who's doing some other stuff right now? So that may not be in the near future. But that was a little long tangent on that, but they're very similar. The IRS and the National Weather Service, what they do is provide essential services. The National Weather Service gives us the information for weather. We wouldn't know 
If there's tornadoes coming, if there's hurricanes coming, lightning, winds, rain, snow, hail, anything without the National Weather Service. AccuWeather would not be able to run without the National Weather Service. The Weather Channel would not be a thing without the National Weather Service. And the IRS makes sure that the government collects the money that it's supposed to from taxes so that it can spend on things like funding the Weather Service or healthcare or infrastructure or the military or whatever all the things that the government funds so in conclusion yes doing taxes stinks and if you found someone who said no it doesn't stink then it'd be a miracle but it could be so much better but if you want someone to blame maybe don't blame the irs maybe blame the billion dollar companies like H&R Block, like TurboTax, that are actively lobbying the government to make sure that you have to use their paid softwares instead of having a free, simple-to-use system that's created by the government. Like some countries do, but oh my gosh, that would be socialism! That would be terrible! What? Oh yeah, convenience, simplicity is socialism. But of course, The people who scream government bad would hate it because they just keep getting lied to. But here are the facts. And you got a lot of facts on this podcast. No one really likes filing their taxes each year in the United States. It takes time. It takes money. It takes a lot of patience. But in other countries around the world, that isn't the case. It's a lot cheaper. What's cheaper than free? And it takes a lot less time. So while the IRS's next step of building their own platform is a big one, there's still a lot more that can be done to make sure that filing taxes has a more positive effect on everybody. So maybe don't vote for politicians who keep spouting claims about 87,000 IRS agents going after you that are false and not true. And you can see it in the writing that they're not true. That's what you can do. And that's what I wanted to talk to you all about this week, give you all the facts on taxes in the U.S. Because it's a sore subject because we all hate it, but it doesn't have to be because it can be a lot easier. And those are the reasons why. So that's all the facts I have for this week on the podcast. Thank you all so much for sticking around, listening to all the facts. If you liked all the facts on this week's edition of the podcast, Remember to follow this podcast, download this episode, episode 106, rate and review the podcast, then check us out on all the socials, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, at Xander's Facts, that is Xander with a Z, and most importantly, remember to tell all your friends, we like to call it around here, spread the facts, Xander's Facts Podcast, tell all your friends about the podcast, about the newsletter, Xander's Weekend Facts, about the YouTube channel, Xander's Facts on YouTube, which posts all our new episodes on there weekly. Go check it out because this episode's going to be on YouTube. Subscribe, whatever, and check out the Xander's Facts link tree because it has all the Xander's Facts links that you need. That is episode 106. But next week, we got some more facts. Episode 107. Y'all, the NBA Finals begin next week. I am recording this Tuesday night, and right now, the Boston Celtics are playing the Miami Heat. The Heat lead the series 3-0, and Monday night, the Nuggets swept. The Denver Nuggets beat the Los Angeles Lakers 4-0, so we know the Nuggets are in the finals. You may know the Heat are in the finals by the time this comes out. I don't know, though. Nope. But next week... Next Wednesday, our Xander's Facts NBA analyst, Hillbilly, it is confirmed, he has agreed, will be back on the podcast next week to break down, to preview the NBA Finals, to break down and recap what we've seen previously in the playoffs, and we're going to make our Finals picks, of course. But the Nuggets, I don't know if y'all remember, but the Nuggets were my Finals pick back before the playoffs started. So... I don't know why you doubt the facts, but there you go. And so the first game of the finals is going to be Thursday, June 1st. 
So that podcast is going to come out a day before the first game of the final slips off. Perfect timing to get all your facts in order before the games begin. Oh my gosh. That's coming up next week. But then in two weeks, episode 108, we're going to talk about another sport. And that is soccer. Because I don't know if you all know this, but this Sunday is the final day of the Premier League season. Manchester City's already clinched the title, but the relegation race is very... Ooh. Who's going to get relegated from the Premier League? We don't know that yet. Or we don't know two of the three teams who are going to get relegated yet. So that's still up in the air. And the Champions League final is coming up in a couple weeks. And that's in two and a half weeks, I believe. So we're going to preview the Champions League final in two weeks on this podcast. We're going to recap the Premier League. And we're going to talk about all the stuff that's going on in soccer. The U.S. men's national team plays next month. The CONCACAF Nations League. Oh, we're playing Mexico. That's going to be good. We're going to talk about all the soccer in two weeks on the podcast. Basketball is next week. So just telling y'all, we got a lot of facts coming up in the next two weeks on this podcast. So stick around. Stay tuned for those. But that is it. That is a wrap on episode 106 of the Xander's Facts Podcast. Thank you all so much for listening, and we'll see y'all with episode 107 next week. Get off my plane.